Well, hello everybody. My name is Scott Sprout, and I'm from Merge Healthcare out of Wisconsin. I've been living in Wisconsin my whole life, except three years in Romania. So any Romanians here? No? Okay. <laughs> so anyways, today I'm going to be talking about a product that we're going to set to release this summer. It's a DICOM migration system. Uh, that's a medical product. If you think this is a medical session, it's not. It just happens to be our uh, area of expertise. So. Um, with, with this product, we are building a migration system and it is sitting on top of an enterprise archive. That's the core product in our group. Uh, we're the number one in the world in that product. And what an enterprise archive is, is basically the landing place in a vendor neutral way uh, for enterprise medical images. So your CT, your MRI, anything. You can throw it at an archive for long-term storage in a vendor neutral way. So different medical devices can pull from that archive. Well, why would you need a migration system? As hardware becomes obsolete, old medical systems need to move into the new product. And hospitals, for instance, are constantly uh, acquiring other hospitals and different things. And they, they have so much medical imaging data that they have to get it into one uh, concrete location. So this is the reason for building a uh, migration system. Uh, I've done other data migrations where it's a long weekend and a couple movies while you're watching it. Medical migrations might take you a year, year and a half, uh, because you're pulling from an old system that does, you cannot say, well, I'll get hard, better equipment for it. Well, the point of the migration is to get rid of the slower equipment. So you need a product that can manage that over the long haul. So migrations take a long time. A given hospital might be doing multiple migrations at the same time uh, from you know, multiple systems. So this is the reason for building this product. Uh, all of our uh, code is basically Java or Groovy. And our core archive right now is still using Ant. And our uh, migration system that we built new is using Gradle. And our long-term goal is to move our core archive from Ant to Gradle. So DICOM, basically what DICOM is, is um, it's digital imaging communication in medicine. And so that is the protocol by which we communicate with the archives. That's a protocol that defines the file format and the communication over TCP IP. V VNA, that is just a general term for vendor neutral archive. These are the benefits. We don't need to go into those. And the size of our product, right now we basically have 16 billion images. What does that look like? Well, in the US we have about a 38% market share. And worldwide we have about 22% market share. So pretty much you, uh, either you yourself or someone you know probably has an image in our product. Uh, so even though we don't have as big of a footprint or notoriety as, I mean, how many of you have heard of Merge Healthcare before today? Anybody? Well, the reason why is we don't have like like buttons or share buttons for the images that we have. It's basically in the back end systems, even though we have a broad exposure like these other products. Okay. So about DMS, it's a highly configurable product. It's very data centric. We manage in our data in Oracle. And as we move it between uh, enterprise archives, highly configurable for the customer. They can manage all their migration settings, schedules, things like that. Feature rich UI for the customer. With five basic main phases in the application, configuring analysis between uh, the archive sampling, migration, the actual migration phase and reporting. So here's just a couple screens. Live reporting for the end user. Configuration of sampling so they can run mini migrations. Uh, a migration isn't just copying and pasting data. When you're uh, combining dis disparate systems, you're going to want to do transformations on the data, like your, your patient IDs from this system look like this, and in this system they look like this. Uh, so you're going to want to merge them together in a nice, uh, simple way, no pun intended with merge. But, and then you'll manage your migration list with the application. And then you'll see uh, detailed reporting of the migration process and the progress and any error reporting that you have with that. So our deployment architecture. We have key technologies there, Oracle Spring, Spring JDBC, um, and the rest there. You, we have DMS components. So the actual migration system is composed of a standalone backend service that handles all the jobs, and then a web tier with a UI layer 
and a service layer, and then a Java integration plugin. So within our backend archive product, we have a, pro a plugin that will communicate with the migration system. Additionally, our archive is deployed on a single server, basic cluster, and an enterprise cluster model. All of our software is deployed on our, our client infrastructure, so we do not have a centralized management. Like a lot of the products that you may work on are deployed on your own infrastructure. So for us, we have to develop, develop things that we can give to our implementation team to deploy on the customer uh, platforms. Additionally, uh, our migration system has to work pretty much uh, version independent with our backend archive. So that's a little bit of a challenge in terms of deployments. Okay, just to show it graphically, the yellow boxes are the new uh, pieces of the puzzle for the migration system with the UI and web services app inside of Tomcat, our service backend service, and then the DMS plugin, which actually resides within the archive application. Then the migration is really managed in Oracle, and we are communicating with the source archive where we're pulling the medical images from, and we're working with the core archive service to migrate to a destination archive. The destination could be our product, and we'd love that, but we're data neutral, so that way we'll allow customers to use us to go from a third party to another third party uh, bypassing us. Again, this is just a, a repeat that we, our actual enterprise architecture has three main architectures, and that's important when we get to RPM deploys. Okay, so I'm gonna do a deep dive. We have, uh, we use uh, Artifactory and Jenkins, and then I'll do a deep dive on the code in these key areas. Uh, hopefully, I mean, we've seen a lot of theoretical code. This is our actual code. So this is what runs in the latest 112, hopefully in 2.0. So, multi-project build structure. For us, we have these 18 key projects, and we are using the settings gradle to configure those. This is just a snippet from the top of our uh, core, build, uh, core build project, where we're applying project, projects and dependencies across all of our projects. We're setting our core versions. And uh, you can see we're using Artifactory there and we're setting our core repositories from the main level uh, project. We use Artifactory as a proxy. Currently we're manually deploying it, but in our future versions as we get our archive up to speed on Gradle, uh, the dependencies that we need to automatically deploy to Artifactory, we want to uh, automatically deploy from our archive product once we get there. Um, Additionally, you can get, you know, commercial versions of that product. We're using the open source version at this point. So this is just a few screens where we do our manual deploys. How many of you use Artifactory? Okay, so you're all well aware of this. We'll cruise through. Our Jenkins model is very simple. We're just using the Jenkins plugin to monitor our unit tests over time of our development cycle. And now we'll dive into code. Uh, dependency graphing. So we have eight, the 18 internal projects for this project and over the development cycle we had a number of refactoring phases. It was very important for us to have a, a nice view of the dependencies and I'm referring to project dependencies of course at this point. So what we're using is GraphViz. How many of you use GraphViz for anything? Okay. Um, I've been using it for years as a standalone but now I'm using the Google service, uh, Google chart. API in this where basically what we did in our uh, task to generate our graph, we cleaned up our project names. As you saw in the previous slide, we have naming conventions for our projects. So what we want to do when we graph it is clean up our project names to make the graph, graph readable. Loop through the Gradle dependencies, use the Google chart API um, to develop, uh, to generate that image. So. I'm providing a sandbox. If you're interested in doing graphing, you can go here to play around with syntax that you might generate for GraphViz. And here's our actual graphing task. So if we look here, I wanted to provide a clean name. So I eliminate any prefixes at that point. Why is that important? If you're using the uh, Google Chart API, there are restrictions on length. 
if, uh, in terms of what you're providing to that service. So if you want to do something alternate than that, like generate a dot file, then you can do it offline. I was talking to someone else, I believe, last night, that they're actually generating their dot files and saving them offline and then reading them into Graphviz. Uh, but for us, we were able to manage that. We don't have a 1,000 projects, so it was small enough. Um, then we just manage our uh, file creation and our inputs and outputs. And then finally, we get into the work after the configuration phase. We had those four main components that I showed you for our project. We define a specialized style for those components, and we defined those base components at this point. So that way, we can apply the style to the GraphViz code. And then we simply loop through our configurations of dependencies. And we create, just like we saw on that sandbox screen, our dependencies of what projects refer to what projects. Oops. And then at this point, we call the Google Chart API, and we're basically providing those parameters that we've configured in the previous screen. And then we use the handy-dandy uh, Groovy syntax to send that URL and write our graph image to the output file. And there is our output. As you can see, we had our four main runtimes in our project, and we're able to see at this point what is dependent, what are these uh, different areas in the product dependent upon. So that way it was very easy for us, like for instance, we had uh, an instance where we had something in the migration project that needed to be used by the verifier project, but the verifier project had dependencies the other way. So we were able to refactor out task management at this point. And it actually, it, although there's a lot of lines everywhere, it makes it quite simple for us to refactor things out as we're going through the development cycle. The next thing within our build script is we do AOP compilation. How many of you are using Aspects in your products? Anybody? Every time I read about Aspects, people say, it's nice, but I haven't found a good use case for it, right? We have two use cases that we're using in our product. One is the UI layer, where we're doing uh, custom security. Our product is built on top of another product, so we needed to use the security model from our core product in the web layer. So we had to develop a custom security layer there. So we're actually uh, using aspects there. In our DAO layer, we're also doing logging, which was very easy. I have the full code on one slide of how we implemented logging so we can look at our um, transactional uh, time checks. Implementation, so basically our implementation, we do a compile time weaving of aspects. There are different options that you have where you can apply aspects through configuration, but when we're doing it for security, we need it at compile time. We don't so want to want to go into configuration and turn off security. So that's why we chose that route. We have a common AOP Gradle file for, as for our aspect projects. We have, we used Aspect J annotations of Java classes, and I provided a task reference if you go that route. Okay, so diving into our AOP Gradle file, we simply apply the plugin, Java plugin. We set up an AJC, AJC configuration for the compiler, so it's not included within our build, uh, our final build. And then at the compile dependency, we added the runtime and the weaver. And then what we did in here is we basically appended this action to the compile Java task. So it will compile uh, the aspects at that point. Now here's a little, little tip that we found. How many of you have ever updated your script, but it says it's up to date already, right? So what we do in a number of our uh, common scripts is we, are self, we provide self-references. So that way, if you decide for your common script to update it and you check it in and you have an automated build, you want those areas that you know, are being used by that script to be recompiled. So this is just a little thing. It would be nice if Gradle added that into the core where if a script gets updated, it was treated as not up to date. But this is a little way around that. And then in the do last, we basically define our ant task using from the previous screen the configuration that we set up. And then we invoke that ant task, setting up our um, source target compatibilities. And we just utilize the source routes defined 
in Gradle. Then our actual project, we just refer to the script plugin. Here's an example aspect. So I mentioned the DAO logging. If I want to turn on logging for a given DAO class, I can simply uh, define it within the SLF4J uh, log config file. And this aspect, basically, it says I'm looking at all of our D uh, DAO classes. And I want to apply this around those. So then I will grab the start time. Then I'll proceed with that given method. And then I will grab the end time. And then basically the target class in that join point, it'll grab the logger and apply the logging. So maybe you have logging sprinkled everywhere in your DAO layer. This is a way to kind of unify it in a single spot. Cleans up the, you know, your given instances. And then for AOP, you might need a, a Java execution to apply that AOP if your IDE doesn't support the runtime of the AOP. So you can just simply apply it to your class path, and it's a normal Java exec. OK, unit testing of the DAO layer. So what we did, it's actually integration. But we, because it's a data, database-centric application using Oracle, we wanted 100% coverage, but we didn't want a running Oracle instance. So what we're doing is we're using an in-memory H2 instance. But there are a few cases where we wanted to utilize Oracle features. So H2 allows you the ability to provide custom functions within your unit tests. So diving into it, um, here we can see that I added H2 database to our test compile. We have a common test resources where we apply all those settings. And then in our spring config file, we basically reference H2 memory version and then in mode Oracle. So that way it will treat your queries like an Oracle dialect. Then we ramp up our database after H2 is instantiated with basically our schema. This is just a sample. And then at the end of our schema, any of our functions that we want to replicate like, like Oracle, we create a class reference to a given simulated class to, to act as if it's that Oracle function. So we'll dive into the two date implementation. And here we have a two date function. And so this is basically the mapping. So I have two variables, just like the Oracle function. And now my H2 database will respond correctly to that. So I can keep full coverage on all my DAO layer. So within that, we have a ramp up script. So here is for a given unit test for the reporting area where I insert sample data with, into the H2 database and I read sample reports into the database that are already compressed. In this case, we store all of our data, uh, our blobs in the database as compressed. And now here is our spring config file for our unit test. So you'll see there's three main scripts. One is our schema that includes our, our functions, our custom functions. Then our test data, which is basically system-wide test data as a basis for everything. And then our specific unit test data. So all of our DAO unit tests will look like this, where we apply this data on top of it. And then here is our spring unit test runner at the DAO layer. That's where I referred to the file in the previous script. And we auto-wire our DAO uh, given class. So here are our two unit tests. And basically, from those scripts that we ran uh, for setup, we're basically loading that given class, find report, and we're basically looking at each of the attributes there to see that it lines up, and that the DAO layer uh, actually did the decompression correctly in number of bytes. We also use Spock for some of our utilities, just a sample Spock file that we have with a simple setup. And in this instance, we're, we're mocking our DAO class. We're setting our main variables. And then in the when block, we're setting actual uh, values. And we're calling the update. And then our final check in the then block, we're determining and we're testing for the load rate to be computed correctly. In the UI layer, uh, I mentioned we did use security. Uh, for our UI layer, we used AOP. 
So we wanted to do unit testing for using mock MVC to fully test the controller layer on the UI. So we, use, we do that to confirm what our status is, expected status, uh, to confirm the object contract. In every JSP that you have, you might be calling certain objects. Uh, so we use our unit test to confirm that object contract between the controller layer and the UI layer and confirm any view path and any other settings that we might have in the page that we're interested in verifying. So as I said, we have granular security. For every given uh, piece of functionality in the site, you can grant access, manage, delete. And here is a sample snippet from one of our controller classes where uh, this is a user that has rights to go to the settings view in the admin section of the application. So we are setting up the model and view there at that point and our main settings view at that point. And so here is what our security aspect looks like. It's basically going against the spring controller, all of our spring controllers in the UI, and then it's targeting with this around advice the settings controller, and it's basically looking and saying, you must have feature settings manage right to view this feature. So here's our JSP where we can follow along objects being sent there, rendered. And then here's our unit test where those highlighted objects in our JSP are set up as our view action objects that we're expecting. So now we set this up with mock MVC. We're auto wiring our web application context. And before we're setting up our mock MVC. So our actual unit test for that settings page looks like this. We have a positive test with the correct security test settings principle, and we have someone without rights at this point where they don't have rights to manage security. So it's a valid user, but they don't have access. So we'll each test, we're calling the URL, we're verifying the HTTP status, our view path, and we're also verifying at this point all of the expected objects that we should get in that page. So we're establishing that contract. So if a developer goes into your controller layer and they make adjustments to the objects that are expected, you're going to know on your unit tests, check in that that's there. Where normally a JSP, you're not going to see that result until you get in and use it. And here's our testing results for those areas in Jenkins. RPM generation. We're using the Nebula plugin, so thanks Netflix for that plugin. And uh, we basically, because we are deploying at the customer site, we provide RPMs to our engineers that are doing the implementations. So we're using the plugin to generate our developers, a developer's version of the RPM, so we can get immediate results and immediate a test. We also provide a couple more outputs from the RPM task. Uh, specifically for our industry, we need to have a soup list, which is basically a, a version we can provide uh, to our legal team the versions of the third-party jars that we're using. So we get that automatically out of our build. And uh, we also de provide dependency conflict detection. So here's a basic sample. How many of you have looked at an RPM plugin, at, at the RPM plugin? Okay. So this is just basically taken and just shortened up from the version right on the site, the OS package. And it looks a lot like the copy task. I know there was a very good presentation yesterday on it, so I won't go too much into it. But basically, you're setting up your RPM, your destination for your files, where it's coming from. And you're setting up any sim links you have, any requirements that you have of the OS, any scripts that you need run, and your basic variables that you need to be set. So that's the sample. Now we're going to dive into our version. Here we're applying the OS package, referring to our artifactory. And then we're also adding the OS package to our dependencies class path for our build script. And then within our configuration phase, we, we built it as a type RPM, uh, not just configuration, but actually our own task that route. And we also, like we did in the other, we made a self-referencing uh, as an input, so that way if we update this build script, we can get the free version, uh, free processing that route. So what we did is because we have the four components, 
we, we specified those as a project list so that way we can process them differently because in our final deployment in the RPM, we need to handle the different cases in a different way. So we created arrays of those projects and we set up our output paths and our general variables. And now we loop through our project list. Uh, this is the point here where we're actually doing the RPM from and into. And we're also setting up sim links. Because we're dealing with multiple versions, we want to have a sim link to the version, uh, the version jar. So that way, our paths and different things of product that's staying static can be constant. So you may want to take that approach of adding sim links. And then we also are doing two different things in here. We're creating an artifact map. I mentioned that we're using the RPM for our developer grade version of the product. We're creating an artifact map, which is just a simple map for output on our RPM completion. So that way, the other developers creating spec files for RPMs can consume that in their RPM scripts. What does that provide us? That provides us the mapping from Gradle cache to where the file should be in the RPM. Additionally, we update our soup list. This is just a continuation. Uh, we don't need to go through each type, um, but we, for our soup list, we copy into uh, the map, the absolute path from where it, it should come from. And then we also specify where our SQL scripts would go. We handle the plugin in the same way, and we also manipulate the jar task at this point to exclude our configuration files as we're going to drop them in a different location. And then our war file, we manage the same way. For compliance, as I said, we need soup list because we need to keep track for medical reasons any software that we use that's third party. This is also the reason why uh, Artifactory is so important for us because we need to have copies of jars so that way we could build from source at any point in time. Okay, soup list. We basically are appending to a map, so quite simply put, the versions. And we have our output file. So that provides the versions. And we're going to add on to this the lookup for the license from the Maven repository. And here we are doing our conflict detection. Now, some of you might be wondering, why do we do our own conflict detection when Gradle provides that capability? And the reason why is because in our product, we might, because we have four different runtimes, we have the possibility of allowing two versions of the jar in two different runtimes. So just saying across all of our projects that the version can't be different uh, might not be feasible for us in each case. So with that conflict detection, we'll get our output. And then the conclusion of our RPM generation we create a new file, basically, for our RPM structure for the other spec files to consume. And then we also create our RPM soup list, which is basically the CSV output. And it's quite simple and groovy. So our R output file for the RPM, we have our, before, uh, our destination and where it belongs and where it's coming from in the Gradle path. And this is handy, especially in the case where we're using uh, Gradle, so we can get the cache location. We also are doing parallel jar signing. Um, how many of you are using the parallel option in, in anybody? Nobody? Um, for us, we had problems in our DAO layer using parallel option, but our jar signing is going to be important for us to uh, speed that up. So what we did is we uh, just basically use great, uh, groovy threading at that point. But there's one little downside, one little catch there. So jar signing, we said we could not use the signing plugin that's provided by Groovy, so we're calling the ant task. So we have uh, signjar.gradle, which provides a sign jar uh, closure. So you can provide the property file, the jar to sign, and then we have basically load, pro load properties with the config slurper to be able to pull in your configuration and pro hand it off to the ant task. Then in our actual uh, script that's calling it, the sign task is looping through our projects and signing it at that point. 
in the configuration. This is the actual processing in the do last where we uh, start threads. So we, at this point, detect is it a released version? If so, add the archive. If the archive is available to sign, we sign it and then we uh, start that thread. And then we add it to a thread list. Now, there is a problem right now in Gradle where calling ant tasks are not thread safe if you create a number of threads. Anyone else reach that, hit that issue? Or, so there is a open issue there. And if you are using ant tasks, I ask that you would vote on that issue, that they actually look and work on that. Uh, if not, I'm going to have to create a task to automate the voting on that issue. So, but anyways, what I had to do, I would love to get rid of this line here, is I have to do that just to get it to work, and I don't like that. But that's because the initialization of that task, there's a, uh, a point in the XML initialization where it will lock up intermittently. So doing this, I'm able to work around it, but I don't prefer that, of course. And then here is the script where I'm looking at my threads that are running, and I'm using the atomic integer to check the state. Once I have a confirmation that they're all complete, then I confirm that they all completed successfully, and I throw a Gradle script exception if they have, did not uh, complete successfully. A uh, couple things. If you're using ALP, well, I think no one was using ALP, um, but if, you're, if you were using it with jar signing, uh, there is a problem with that because you're auto-generating uh, proxy classes. And so if your jars are signed and you're auto-generating classes, there will be a security exception. So third-party jars, you might actually have to re-sign in your product if you decide to go that route. What's next for us, as I mentioned, we are going to be uh, taking our core archive and moving it to Gradle, which will allow us to automate uh, our deployment of those artifacts that we need from the core archive. Uh, there's a thing that we participate in. It's called a connectathon, and that is kind of like a boot camp for, our, for coders where it's intense. Uh, basically, in the medical industry, all the coders get together and they test the interoper interoperability between other products. And it's an intense week where they have to do that. So long build times, getting components ready can really damper the effects. So moving to Gradle will be key for us. Any questions? If there's any code samples that you want from this, I'd be happy to provide them. Just shoot me an email. Jar signing, see, the reason why is the artifacts are already prepared. So we, it's really something that you could you know, do in parallel. And so for us, when we get to our core archive, we wanted to solve this problem by being able to, because you know, it might take five minutes, 10 minutes for jar signing. The artifacts are already prepared, so it makes perfect sense to do that in parallel. So the question was, have, have we tried to use normal Java code for the jar signing? No, we haven't. That's one thing we could try. We're just trying to do it the Gradle way. <laughs> so there is that open task uh, or open issue that it would be nice so that way we could use it the normal route. Well, thank you. <laughs>